What is up guys, my name is Will from Ghost Hack and we're back at it again with another tutorial. The last tutorial was about how to make this really thick and juicy growl base, but today we're gonna change it up a little bit and we're gonna do a tutorial on this really hard, very digital sounding trap screech lead. And this is what it sounds like. Just by itself and without the mastering, this is what it sounds like. Now before I get into exactly how it's made, I want to say that this is a mixture of two sounds. The first one is the main sound that I'm going to show you how to do here. And the second one is just a layer sound to fill in space and make it a little thicker. It's just sitting quietly at the background and it's very, very simple. It's nothing complicated at all. I'll get to it after I go over the main patch. But for right now, let's just go over what I did on the main sound. All right, I'll tell you right off the bat, this is not a very complicated lead to make. You just have to know the techniques to make it. If any of you are familiar with artists like Spag Hetty and E. Hyde, they use sounds that's, it's commonly referred to as the cooker lead. It's like a sign screech lead using sine waves and distortion to make this really screechy sound. And we're doing the same thing here. First off, we're just gonna leave this at a normal saw. I know it looks a little funky like this, but it actually is like the normal saw that comes up. We're just using the mirror to kind of, you know, warp it a little bit here. So select the mirror and you can put this at 65%. This is gonna create this kind of shape and it's even on both sides. And this will make the sound much more harmonic than if it was just a normal saw wave. You can hear it. If I turn it on off, this is what it would sound like. But since I flip on the mirror, it sounds a little more like this. So it just changes it up and makes it a little more interesting. You can bump the octave up too, and really that's all you have to do for this one. Oh, also turn the level down to 60% so it's not going too hard through like the effect section and everything else. Next, you can flip on oscillator B, and that's just gonna be the normal saw wave. You know, nothing done here, except the level turned down to 50% and the octave going up three. So it's a lot higher than the last one an entire octave to be exact. And that's gonna just add a really, you know, the high pitched layer on top of this really nice sounding waveform. And it's gonna make it that much thicker. Next, we're gonna just flip on the sub. We don't have to flip direct out for this one. And we can just drop it down one octave and turn the level to 14. What this is doing is it's not acting as an actual sub bass. We're not gonna hear sub from this. It's just gonna act as more frequency, more low frequency going into the distortion, which is gonna add that screech sound that we're missing right now. Then lastly for the oscillators is the noise oscillator. We're gonna select horns of fear for this one. This is in the SOR tab. And what this is, I'll show you what it sounds like by itself. It sounds like this. It's this really dissonant kind of ambient sound and I think it adds a really good layer to the lead that we already have. What I did here was I flipped on keyboard tracking and I turned the pitch up to 37. Now that's, that's key. 37 is the magic number for Horns of Fear because it's in a certain key when you play it and if it's not pitched up at 37, then it's not going to be playing the same note you are. Like I could be playing an E, but it might be uh, outputting a G tone actually. Pretty much it isn't tuned directly to C when this noise was put in here, so you have to kind of tune it yourself. 37 is the, the key number here. Turn it down to 25% and it just adds a nice little ambient layer. Now we can flip on the filter. Y'all might not have seen this coming. I'm actually using the MG Low 12. The MG just stands for Moog, by the way. That's because it's based off the old Moog synth filters. It's kind of, kind of cool, kind of a replication of the analog world there. But what I'm doing here is I have both A and B running through this and also have keyboard tracking on. Now what's happening is I have the cutoff at a fixed position at 1892 hertz, which that's kind of specific for this one. You have to be specific with that one. And then you have to turn the resonance up up to 38 or just somewhere around there. Now basically that's taking a frequency, a, an even frequency in this lead and boosting it up. And because the keyboard tracking is on, it's going to follow that you know single harmonic wherever it is across the spectrum, no matter which note I'm playing. So it's gonna boost that. And this is only really gonna come into dramatic effect when it goes through distortion. I can show you the effect of that once I flip the disto on, but I'm gonna get to that in the effects section. With the low pass, this is what it sounds like. You can even see up top here the frequency that it's boosting. 
it's not the bottom frequency, it's not the fundamental, but it's the first one up from that. All right, now we are going to hop into the effects. The first one, like I was saying, is the distortion. This is gonna be tube distortion. All you need to do is turn the drive all the way up and add some little post filtering right here. I just have it at uh, around 600 for the frequency and 0 0.1 for the Q factor. That's just really basic high pass action there. And that's just cutting out the muddy low frequencies that we're getting because you are getting a lot of low frequencies. If I turn it on off, this is what it sounds like. Now we have that really hard digital sound that we were missing before. And this is all coming from the sub. If I turn the sub off, this is what it sounds like. It still sounds like the other one just with like, you know, just normal distortion. If you put the sub in there, the sub frequencies distorting the high frequencies is what makes it really deep and digital. And that's exactly the technique that's used in the sine cooker lead. All you gotta do is pitch a sine wave down two octaves and up two octaves, distort it with a full tube distortion and you get the sine cooker lead. But it's just a little bit different because I'm using different oscillators and a few other techniques here. We'll throw that on post to get rid of the low frequencies and now we can flip on the hyper dimension. So what I'm doing here, I have the mix at 25% and I'm doing the classic thing with the dimension. Size all the way down, mix up to 50%. Y'all know the drill, this is what always goes down. Just add basic stereo width and make it a little thicker. Oh, I forgot to go over the use of the filter. Basically, if I turn the filter off, this is what it sounds like. There's a lot of high frequency action and it's not as thick in the mid regions. If I do this and turn that on and just boost the frequency, you'll get what I played before. But watch what happens when I mess around with the resonance. You can get some really interesting kind of variations there if you wanted to modulate that. I just left it at like 38%, was it? I completely forget. I hope it was 38%. But anyway, just around there to get some, to get a nice, a nice mixture of the two. Now we can flip on the phaser. The rate's all the way down, depth's all the way down, and the frequency is all the way down. This is gonna add that kind of guitar amp effect, and this is what it sounds like when the mix is all the way up. It just boosts and cuts away certain frequencies and makes it sound like it's running through an amp. But we're just gonna turn that down to about 50% just to get half of the overall mix because it is a very strong sound. Next, we can throw some reverb on it. There's gonna be a hall reverb. The size is at 26%, decays at 3.7, uh, lows all the way down, high cuts at 35, and the spin and the spin depth are normal. Basically, this is just a really simple reverb. I had the mix up at 35, it's nothing special at all, but what's when the magic happens is when it goes, it's gonna go through the multi-band compression. With the reverb, it sounds like this. The usual stuff, and now we can turn on the multi-band compression. So, as I said, flip on multi-band. The threshold is at negative 9.9. .9. Ratio is normal. Uh, attack and release and gain are also normal. The high band and the mid band are both normal at 100%. I just brought the low one down all the way to you know not compress any of the muddy low frequencies that we don't want. So that's all that is doing. But since the reverb is before the compression, once I lift up the note, it's also going to multi-band compress the reverb. So you'll get a very, very nice reverb tail. It sounds like this. And especially in trap music, if you add that when the lead is like the main element, every time you lift up the note, there's always, you're still gonna hear the lead. There's gonna be a lot of space. It's gonna fill out that region and make the song sound thicker overall than if you were to just put the reverb after the compression. So almost done here, let's flip on the EQ. What I'm doing here is I'm lowering the low end right here, I'm just about all the way. We have it on a shelf. The gain is all the way down at negative 24. I have the Q factor at 83, so there's a little peak down there, but that just makes the curve sharper in general. And the frequency is at 105 hertz, just somewhere around there to get rid of the sub stuff. Then at the top, I just boosted the high a little bit, again, a shoving EQ. I have the gain at 3.2, Q factor's all the way down, and the frequency is at 3199, just somewhere up there to boost the high frequencies. It's pretty simple stuff. Lastly, this is just personal preference. I always do this. I add a flanger. I, I don't even mess with these. Like nothing, everything is just normal here. All I do is turn the mix down to 50%. And this is just gonna, having that constant kind of flanger moving in the background that you don't really notice it at first. It's not something you listen to and you're like, oh yeah, I can hear that flanger moving around. It's kind of a subconscious thing. It just changes it up every time you play it that little bit. It adds a little more life in my opinion. Last but not least, let's make that vibrato. So if you hold alt, you can drag this triangle so it's right in the middle. 
And then again, holding alt, you can create this kind of, you know, just normal triangle shape. And holding alt snaps it to the grid so you know you'll get exactly on instead of trying to just guess at this point. You know, it's a lot better to just snap it directly get it to the grid and have it perfectly lined up. Now we don't want just a straight up triangle wave because that doesn't sound very natural. When like a voice does a vibrato, it doesn't, you know, immediately change direction. It does a sine wave motion. A sine wave is a very, very natural sound. And that's what a normal vibrato looks like. If you even like record it and look at it on the spectrum analyzer, you can see a sine wave. So what we're going to do here is we're going to hold alt again, and we're going to take these. And now since we're holding alt, we can drag all of them versus just dragging one like this. So we're going to create not a straight up sine wave. I think we're going to just kind of find a mixture about there would probably be nice. So what we're going to do for this one, we're going to turn off BPM. That's, that's very critical. You can leave it on trigger or off, you know, however you want to do it. But I usually turn it to 9 hertz or so, 9, 10 hertz. Some people like it faster, some people like it slower. It just depends. You can even modulate it if you wanted to. So that's going to be our main vibrato shape. So I'm pretty sure you all know how to do this, but I'm going to go over it anyway. What you do is you go into the source, select LFO 1. So we have our uh, single LFO selected for that one. You're going to set the destination to the master tune. That's every tune of everything. And we're going to turn the amount just up to one. It's one is all you need. Actually, one is a little too much. Honestly, we're bringing down the output to we're bringing it down 40 percent. So it's at 60 percent. So the max, you know, we can go here at the very top and at the very bottom is 60 percent of the one semitone right here. Now, I say up top and bottom, not just, you know, bottom to top because I have bipolar selected. And bipolar means that the center pitch is going to be right in the center line. Anywhere up is going up and anywhere down is going down. Even though this is going up one, you know, that just means that up is up, down is down. If I reversed it to negative one, that would mean down is up, up is down, if that makes sense. But basically, we just want it going both directions. We don't want it to, like, be the main pitch be down here and then just going up or just going down. We want it both ways. So just make sure this double arrow is selected. And then for the aux source, we add the mod wheel. Now the aux source is basically like this output. It's just a whole nother thing. If the aux source, whatever it is, is at 100%, we're gonna get all of the possible output we can from this, you know, using the settings we put in. And then if it's down, we're gonna get n none of the effect. It's basically a dry wet at this point. So you can see the mod wheel down there that I'm modulating. And that is how you make the vibrato. If my explanation did not make sense to you, don't worry. All you have to do is just copy these settings. As far as the post-processing goes for this sound, it's nothing complicated at all. I'm just using an EQ. I chopped down the low end at around, where is that? That's around 300 hertz or so. And that's just getting rid of anything that's still there. You know, after I got rid of the EQ, there's still some small stuff, DC offset. So that's all that's getting rid of. I, you know, did a little notch here, not all the way, I just dipped it down with a peak at around 18,000 because there was frequencies in there that were very, very strong and very harsh and they were, you know, stabbing through a little bit too much. Um, other than that, all I have is just, you know, a boost of the very high end around 9,000 hertz because even though we distorted it and did multiband compression, that low pass that we used in, you know, the original serum is it's still ducking down a lot of the higher frequencies we were missing. So I just boosted that up. All right, sounds really good, but it's lacking a layer. What we're going to do is just we're just going to copy the exact same notes from this one onto another serum. And what's going to happen is very, very simple stuff. They're both saw waves. One is up one octave and the other is up one octave and seven semitones. And what this is going to do is going to add the fifth uh, interval here, because if we play it, that's just a super saw right there. If we add this with the fifth. We get some harmonies in there to make it even thicker. I love doing this with leads just as a subtle background thing. You don't notice it. You only notice it when it's gone. Like I said, detune saws at uh, nine voices. They're both at 1.5 for the detune. And I have envelope one here. I edited it a little bit. It's at uh, 6.9 milliseconds. I don't remember if that's the default, but that's what, what it is at for the attack. The release is at 170, which I know is not the default. I wanted a little bit more of a release at the very end, so it's not an immediate cutoff. I wanted it to fade out just a little bit and be a little bit smoother. So that's what that does. Again, super, super basic. For the effects, it's just a hyper dimension, you know, doing really simple stuff. The mix up a little bit. You know, did the same dimension thing that we did with the original patch. We 
also have a chorus, which again is just very normal stuff. I'm pretty sure all of this is pretty much normal. I brought the depth down to 17.9, but there's nothing fancy going on here at all. Just drop down the mix. You do, however, want to make sure that a high pass filter is turned on all the way down or low pass filters turn on all the way up. Either way, it doesn't make any difference. But reverb, I'm pretty sure is the exact same as the original patch. Either way, it's nothing, nothing important really at all because you're barely going to hear this. Post processing for the layer is very, very similar. It's just the EQ, again, chopping it off down in this low bass region and bumping up the high end that I was kind of missing in the layer as well. Both of them together sound like this. Add some drums, some brass shots, maybe some mastering, and you've got yourself a track. All right, thank you guys so much for watching. If you learned something from this tutorial or you just like it, make sure to hit subscribe because we're going to do more of these tutorials in the future and we don't want you to miss out on any of them. Again, thank you all so much for your support and I will see you in the next video. Happy producing. Mm -hmm.